Internal Family Systems has transformed my own life. I'm convinced that it can do the same for you. For me, it's helped reduce levels of stress, anxiety about what other people may think of me. It's quietened that inner voice inside my head. Dr. Gabor Mate is a big fan. Internal Family Systems. Oh my God, that's what I'm doing at the moment. IFS. Yeah, it's incredible. The shorter stuff. Tim Ferriss has said that IFS has been transformative for him. IFS is an incredible system, which has been very helpful to me personally, that will help you work with your inner critic. The very best way to understand it is to watch someone go through it, and that's exactly what you're about to see. I become the patient. The inventor of IFS takes me through a session. It has transformed my life, and I truly hope it changes yours. I'd love to start this conversation by saying thank you to you because internal family systems, the therapy that you have created, I think has probably had more impact on me than anything else I've done over the past five or 10 years in terms of my feeling of calmness, contentment, happiness, as well as my physical health. And so I really just wanna acknowledge you and say, a huge thank you, and it's a real honor to have you on my show. Well, I'm very, very honored to be on your show, and particularly since uh, IFS has had that impact, I, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to hear that, and I know you are very influential, so it's, it's great, really great to be here. What my goal is with this conversation is to understand IFS better, and to really showcase, I hope, to all of the listeners and viewers just how relevant it is for what I think is each and every single one of us. So could you maybe explain, you know, IFS, internal family systems, what does that actually mean? So, you know, it's not the most illustrative name. The family part of it applies to having these parts, what I call parts inside our minds, and how they interact with, with each other, almost like an external family. <clears throat> and I'm trained, I have a PhD in family therapy. So when I came to the phenomena, and I was just taught this by the clients, I started to apply that family therapy lens to what I was learning from my clients. And it turns out it, it applies really well. So the basic assumption is that everybody has these parts and that that's a good thing, that it's the nature of the mind to be subdivided this way, to have these what other systems call subpersonalities, that we're born with them. And all of them have valuable qualities and resources to help us in our life. But trauma and attachment injuries, which is basically bad parenting, force them out of their naturally valuable states into roles that can be destructive and uh, fr freeze them in time. There, many of them are stuck back during the trauma and they think you're still five years old, for example. So just being able to see where they're stuck in the past and going and getting them out of there uh, often allows them to transform into their naturally valuable states. Yeah. You know, I want to get into the process a bit later, but the, this idea of parts, I think it's, it's really worth spending a bit of time here because, you know, in, in our sort of Western um, societal model, I guess in the English language, we often refer to the mind in, in a kind of singular way, don't we? That this is, this is my mm. mind. My mind yeah. is speaking. Right. And you beautifully in your work in all of these books just show that actually there's a multiplicity to the mind. There are lots of different minds within us. And I think for some people that will be, I don't know, a bit a bit scary, perhaps a bit disconcerting. Mm. I mean, how do you help people understand that? Yeah, well, as you're alluding to, it's been an uphill battle to try and bring this perspective because <clears throat> culturally, we are oriented to think of ourselves as having one mind with different thoughts and emotions that emanate from it, but there's just really one of us. And the idea of having many minds with different voices or thought patterns, et cetera, that have autonomy is scary because that has been pathologized and 
you think about, you know, movies in the past like Sybil or uh, there's a whole series of movies about multiple personalities and how crazy they are. And so the idea that you might have these separate subpersonalities is it, it's, it's a, a creepy idea for that reason at first for some, not everybody. And, and actually, for whatever reason, it's become a lot less creepy over the last uh, couple of decades, I'd say. But still, I get a lot of uh, pushback. Like, aren't you, are you creating uh, multiple personality disorder? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, even that last thing you said, are we creating, or, sorry, are you creating multiple personality disorder? I think that really speaks to the kind of systems component of internal family systems that actually you're looking at these parts and how they relate to one another rather than that part in isolation. And in your latest book, there's a really beautiful section in the beginning when you talk about systems thinking. And I, I'm very passionate about this because I, I feel as a medical doctor that we have gone down the route of separating the body into discrete parts that actually yeah. don't speak to one another. And they're, you know, the, the heart problem goes to the cardiologist, the lung problem goes to the, the lung specialist, the, the stomach problem goes to the gastroenterologist. And, you know, I, I as a GP, a generalist, I, I can't, you know, I, I've got so many cases I can think of where the patient would be referred to one of them and say, no, no, this is not your heart. Go back to your GP. You refer to another specialist. And th this whole cycle goes on. Everyone's telling you what it's not rather than what it is and not sort of pulling it all together. And there was this bit of text in your last book, which I, I really like, where you mentioned, you say this, you mentioned that giving a troubled person a psychiatric diagnosis and seeing that as the sole or main cause of their symptoms was unnecessarily limiting, pathologizing, and could become self-reinforcing. When you tell a person that they are sick and ignore the larger context in which their symptoms make sense, not only do you miss leverage points that could lead to transformation, but you also produce a passive patient who feels defective. And I thought that summed it up beautifully. Thank you, yeah. Um... You know, family therapy's big insight was you can't take an acting out kid out of their family and just tell them to cut it out. You have to kind of see the context in which that acting out makes sense. And, and uh, often there's various forms of dysfunction happening and the, the kid is reacting to that and either to protect himself or to protect other members of the family is in some kind of extreme role in the family. And so we learned as family therapists to reorganize the family and free up the kid to be who he's really designed to be. The same thing I found true for these parts, which is partly why I call it internal family systems, that these parts are forced into these roles and get stuck in the roles because of the dynamics of the inner family and can be freed from those roles as you found. And when they are, they'll transform just like a kid in a family into their naturally valuable states. And you can apply that kind of systems thinking to all the things you just talked about. <clears throat> I just did a series of conversations with someone I know you've had on your show, Gabor Mate. Oh, yeah. And uh, we basically stumbled into the same uh, kind of belief system about chronic medical illness the, uh, from very different perspectives and our approaches are different, but we really found in terms of data, basically the same patterns and diagnosing colitis or whatever the condition is. And then, as you say, shipping them to a specialist who medicates them without, you know, uh, medicine and psychotherapy are both designed to kill the messenger rather than to listen to the message. And so both Gabor and I are trying to get people to actually listen to the, find, in my language, the part that's trying to get your attention through the symptom or is trying to 
punish you in some way or is just really yeah. upset inside. Yeah, I mean, like you, I'm a huge fan of uh, Gabble's work as well. And, um, you know, the, the term part, I, I just, I'm trying to reflect on my own journey through this because I came from a place of not knowing much, but but I felt the difference. Like I felt after sessions, I felt lighter, I, like physically lighter, mentally lighter, emotionally lighter. And I would find that I wasn't getting triggered often by the same things. And for me, what was really fascinating is that someone told me early on that this is one of the few forms of therapy that goes into the trauma and processes it there and then. Mm -hmm. I thought that that really got my attention. I thought, wait a minute. So you go in, you sort it out, and then it's done effectively for, for some people. And, and that was really, I think it was really enlightening because I think, you know, a lot of the talking therapies, I guess, that people are exposed to are about repeatedly, you know, I, I don't want to sort of um, mischaracterize uh, certain therapies, but, the, but as a principle, you know, talking your way through the problems and then trying to, you know, co consciously change your pattern of thinking the next time you're in that scenario. And I think that can, of course, play a role. But what I found with IFS is that you literally go in, you rewrite the story, your brain <laughs> absorbs that new story, and then you go out into the world as a different person. I, I thoroughly agree. Uh, you know, there's the line, you can't change what happened, you just have to move on from it. You can't change the past. It turns out that in this inner world, you can literally change the past by doing what you were talking about, which is to go into the trauma and actually retrieve the part that's stuck back there and bring it to a safe place. And even as you, if I were to have you go into and wherever one of your little boys is stuck in the past and be there with him in the way he needed it, I would have you ask him, does he need you to do anything for him back there? And he, he might have, he might watch you protect him from whoever is hurting him. And that literally changes the past for that boy, that inner boy. It doesn't change the facts of what happened in the outside world, but you're right. From my point of view, too many therapies are trying to get this cognitive insight to happen when in fact these parts are stuck in a limbic place that you're not, you're not even touching with those insights. It was quite an incredible experience to, you know, I've, done, I've, I've had many, many IFS sessions and, you know, one in particular that I remember was, you know, we went through the process. Uh, I think this was done on Zoom, actually. Maybe this was in the first lockdown from recollection. But you literally, in your mind, go back to a particular incident that you can then vividly see. And then I remember that the therapist helped me as my 40-year-old self to go in and sit alongside, maybe next to the five-year-old little boy and see the situation. I was observing the situation first of all. I could see the interaction. And then I think he guided me to speak to myself as a five-year-old and, mm -hmm. you know, understand the pain and say, look, I understand. I, I, I get why you're feeling so upset at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but then once we'd done it a few times in this session, I also then spoke to my mum, right? Mm -hmm. So this was a session where it was me and my mother. And I could see my mum as the way she looked when I was five and I was having a conversation with mum and I was almost uh, helping the two of them. And it sounds crazy to say the two of them because it was it was me as a five-year-old. I understand. And my mum, like, what, 35 years ago, a lot younger, looking different, but almost, you know, being there, trying to, trying to show each other each other's point of view. And then, um, 
and then watch the room change, the, the whole dynamic change in my five-year-old self had a smile and he was now playing with his mom. And then I check in a few times and say, do you need anything more? And, you know, there's a whole process there, which um, of course we can talk about later perhaps, but it, I, I think what's incredible is that it feels like someone might think that's an inner sort of made up world, right? but it felt real. And, and then not only did that feel real, Dick, it transformed that part of my relationship with my mother. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to consciously try. It just, and that's what I think for me, I'm sorry to go on about it, but that's the incredible power <laughs> is that you rewrite the story. Mm -hmm. And then I know when you sleep, so I spoke to Matthew Walker about this recently on the show, the professor of uh, sleep medicine. Um, and he just says, yeah, you can literally rewrite memories uh, I think it's in the in the REM sleep cycle. I think um, so. Yeah. Any any sort of any sort of comments on what I've just said? Well, you said a lot. Um, first, I'll say yes. It isn't imagined, and that is something I've run into frequently, where people think, "Oh, that's a nice fantasy you're creating with with a client." For me, it's all a, a very real other world. That's uh, just you know just right accessible to everybody if they just turn their focus inside and begin to ask some questions and, and look around. And what happens in that inner world has a big impact on your outer world and on your body and your mind. So, um, and that's been a tough sell too. So it isn't like you're imagining what you did with your mother or with that five-year-old. Uh, it's it's literally a different world. It's the it's the world that shamans enter, in, with their ways of entering it, and th they have similar processes. Uh, yeah. One of the things I love about your way of thinking is that all of these parts that exist within us. You say that there are no bad parts, right? Uh, in fact, the, you know that's the name of your latest book, which is. I mean, I've read a few of them. This one's, I think, a great intro for people. It's really concise and it gets really to the point for people. But yeah, that, that idea that there's no bad parts, they're all playing a role. You know, like, you know, we could say in our outside world, all of our behaviors are serving some role. We can try and change the behavior and then realize after two or three weeks, we keep reversing back. Or we can try and identify, well, why am I going to that behavior? It's it's kind of completely mirrored in our inner world as well. Those parts are there for a reason, aren't they? Yeah. Um, if they're causing symptoms or problems, it's likely that they're in their extreme role. It's not who they are. And that's one of the big mistakes our culture and also psychotherapy has made has been to assume the part is what it seems to be. So this inner critic is just a bundle of uh internalized parental voices and the the binging addictive part is just uh, at, is just a, an addiction and so on and so on and when you think of them that way then you're going to want to either try to, your best to ignore them or to fight with them and wrestle them into submission or do something coercive with them and that's what I was doing when I my clients first started talking to me about their parts I was trying to get them to stand up to the critic or or contain, contain the binge, and it was just making it worse. And at some point, I just decided, because uh, it was not working at all, to ask what's going on. And I learned that that was a big mistake because they are these very valuable parts that are frozen in these traumas get forced into these extreme roles and think you're still five years old and think they still have to protect you in the way they did back then. And once they learn that you're not still five years old, which you can just tell them, that, and often they're shocked. And then once they, they learn that there's this other person in there who can talk to them, what you called your 40-year-old self, 
which I've come to call the self with a capital S. And this, this I think is the biggest contribution of IFS is that in addition to these parts, and especially when they relax in open space, there's this other person who emerges with the, basically the same qualities in everybody. And at some point I decided to catalog the qualities of that person. And oddly enough, they all begin with the letter C. So we have the eight C's of self-leadership, which include calm. Like, let's say I was working with you and I was uh, trying to help you with your inner critic. And I had asked you how you feel toward it. And you said, I hate it. And I said, well, let's just ask that part that hates it so much to give us a little space for a few minutes. And if it was willing to, then I'd say, now, how do you feel toward it? And if it really separated, you'd say some version of, I'm just kind of curious of why it's calling me names all the time. Seconds earlier, you hated it. Now you're curious, you're calm, you're confident. You might even have compassion for it spontaneously. And also you have the courage to work with it. You have, you're creative in how you work with it. You, um, you, you see it clearly now, it's not a big monster, it's a teenage kid in there and you feel more connected to it. You want to connect more to it. All of those we've come to see as qualities of this self that when I would do the same process of getting other parts to separate would pop out in everybody. And it's the same, basically the same person who knows how to heal and knows how to relate in a healing way, both to parts and to people. As you learn through this process to become compassionate to every part that lives inside you, I found that the natural consequence of that is you find it much easier to be compassionate to all the people, all the parts, all your interactions in your external world. Again, this mirror, like what's going on inside completely reflects what's going on outside. And I feel that's one of the reasons why, you know, I said to you at the start of this conversation, IFS has had a huge impact on my sense of calm, contentment, happiness, well-being, my relationships, because it's not just about healing yourself, I don't feel. It's also through healing yourself, you you instantaneously heal your interactions with everyone else as well. Yeah, you said that so beautifully. And that is some of the, what excites me now is to bring it to interactions in, in systems that are larger. Because you're right, how you relate to these parts inside is going to mirror how you relate to people in the outside world. So if you hate your critic and someone's critical of you, that part that hates it is going to interact with that person. If instead you're, you're, you can uh, listen to and, re and help relax and ultimately have huge compassion for your critic, then when this person is critical of you, you'll see past their part, you'll see the pain that might be driving their criticism, you'll have compassion for them, and you can interact with them in a totally different way. So that's a big part of the larger vision of this is helping people relate with compassion both to their parts and then to the people around them. I wonder if we could get into some specifics so that people can really kind of understand what specific conditions this might be helpful for. I don't even like that question. I don't like the word conditions because again, that's quite pathologizing and it's sort of putting people in a box. But I guess in a view of where much of society currently is and how they see labels and sort of diseases, um, maybe we could go back to the start when you came up with this, you know, the, the, the origins of this idea. And I believe it was around people who were suffering with eating disorders. Yeah. Yeah, I, at the time, was, I just graduated my PhD and I was a zealous family therapist. I thought we'd found the Holy Grail and that people who were spending a lot of time mucking around in the intrapsychic world were wasting their time because we could fix all that just by reorganizing these external relationships. And I was determined to prove that 
And so uh, I picked a symptom that you could count to, to be able to show good outcome, which at the time was, this was back around 1981. Uh, so th I'm old and this is, the model has been around a long time. But um, yeah, bulimia was a kind of new diagnosis at the time. And so we gathered together 30 bulimic kids and did straight structural family therapy with the families. And at least my clients didn't get better. And so out of frustration, I began asking why, and they started talking this language of parts. They would describe how when something bad happened, this critic would attack them inside. And that would bring up a part that felt totally worthless and empty and alone and young. And that feeling was terrifying, was really, really distressing. So almost to the rescue would come in the binge and would turn them into an unfeeling eating machine. And there'd be a lot of relief in that. But then after the binge wore off, the critic would attack them now for being a pig on top of everything else. And that, of course, would bring back that worthless, empty, young place. So the bench had to come back and they'd be trapped in that vicious three-part spiral for days. And again, it was intriguing to me because it sounded like these sequences of interaction that we were studying in families. And uh, as I've, you know, Gabor and I had this conversation too, as I've studied more and more addictions, quote unquote, you do find that same kind of three-part circle happening with most 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 addictions. I mean that three-part cycle you you just outlined. I'd be surprised if anyone listening or watching this can't relate to some element in their life where they went through that pattern, whether it was as extreme and as severe as an eating disorder, or whether it was possibly I don't know, trying to cut out sugar and managing for a few weeks, but then having the kind of dive into the tub of ice cream one night in front of the sofa, and then feeling worthless afterwards or the following morning and then shame and guilt. And then, um, but, but I guess the IFS approach or one component of it is that it's not them that's feeling shame and guilt it's a part of them is that is, right. yeah and yeah think, totally and we sort of have that in our language already right we talked about how language works against us sometimes in terms of oh it's our mind and our body without recognizing there's many different parts to our mind but maybe language also helps us here as well because we you know we sometimes say don't we it's so uh, that's you know a part of me doesn't want that to happen or mm -hmm. you know that's kind of there in common parlance so in some ways that helps us understand, yeah, it's not me, it's a part of me. And that's right. yeah. That's why I use the word part. It, it isn't that descriptive of these inner little beings, but it's the most user-friendly word. It's the word that most, like you said, everybody uses in their daily parlance. So if I'm you know, meeting you for the first time and you describe your problem to me and I say some version, oh, so when this happens, you this, a part of you feels this inside, is that right? People say, yeah, that's right. Oh, and then another thing, and then you start to criticize yourself. So that critic comes in, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And then what happens? And I can say, oh, so another part does this. And people don't say, what the hell are you talking about? Where they would if I said one of your subpersonalities or one of your ego states or something like that. Parts come in different forms. I know, you talk about them as exiles, uh, protectors, managers, firefighters. I wonder whether you could explain what these different parts are and how they become formed. Yeah, so those, what you just described are the roles that they're forced into, not who they, who they are when they're not hurt or burdened or forced into being responsible protectors. But yeah, when I was hearing about this originally from these bulimic kids, I'm a systems guy, so I'm listening for distinctions and patterns. And, and the big distinction that leaped out immediately was between the parts of them that were hugely vulnerable and hurt or terrified or felt total 
totally worthless. And then the parts that tried to keep all that locked away and protect protected clients so that that all that stuff never got triggered and was kept in a kind of inner basement all the time. And to go back to the, the vulnerable parts, so you've heard the term inner children before. These are these young, very, very vulnerable and sensitive parts of us who, when they're not hurt, give us all kinds of delight and creativity and joy and playfulness and so on. But once they get hurt, and again, they're the most sensitive parts of us, so they get hurt the most, or terrified, or shamed. They carry what I'm going to call the burden of, of pain, or, or fear, or worthlessness. It's like, um, almost like during the trauma, the beliefs and emotions from the trauma enter the part, almost like a virus and attach to the part and then drive the way it operates from that point on. And so parts contain burdens, but they aren't the burdens they carry. Those came into them from those experiences. So yeah, the parts, so these exiled parts carry those particular burdens uh, from being rejected or abandoned or neglected or, or actually physically abused and so on. And after they get hurt, they leave, they shift from their delightful state. And now they have the power to make us feel all that sort of perpetually all the time. And they're frozen in time, like I say, in the trauma, and they can pull us back into that, those scenes. And so we sort of naturally, and then our culture, at least in the US, this being a rugged individualist culture, we are told to lock all that away and just move on. Don't look back. You can't change what happened. Just move on. And in doing that, you're moving away from, you're exiling these very precious, young, vulnerable parts of us simply because they got hurt and they carry those burdens. And when you get a lot of exiles, you feel a lot more delicate and the world seems a lot more dangerous because so many things could trigger them. And when they get triggered, it's like these flames of emotion explode from those basements and threaten to make it so you can't function or make it so you're, you're just constantly feeling their feelings. What, what do those flames look like? Is that anger? Is that rage? Is that a blazing row with your partner? What, what does that look like? Yeah, so um, the the flames that the survivors of abuse that I studied for so long are most afraid of are much more emotional pain and terror and shame. That's what gets locked up first. Then the protectors go into rage uh, and then they become scary too. So they become what I call protectors in exile. So you wind up locking up not just these vulnerable parts, but also the parts that get extreme in their, their fury to try and protect you. Uh, and, and then you also try to lock up the other parts that are just trying to keep you higher than those flames of emotion uh, that we call firefighters that often tend to, to lean toward addictions and things like that, T toward things that can counter all this pain or shame or terror and get you higher than those flames. So. Yeah, so when you get a lot of exiles, other parts are forced into roles we call protectors. And some of them are trying to manage your life so that nothing touches those exiles. And they'll manage your relationships so that no one gets close enough to hurt them, or they'll manage your appearance so that people don't reject you, or they'll manage your performance so that you get a lot of accolades. Uh, and so they're constantly thinking and managing and worrying. And uh, so most of us are very familiar with those because they run our lives. 
they're also become the inner critics. They're, they're criticizing you usually to try and motivate you to do better, look better, try harder. But sometimes they criticize you to run down your confidence so that you don't take any risks and you stay small and hide your, hide your uh, power. And there's a whole variety of what we call manager protective roles. Uh, I just mentioned a few of them, but women in particular are socialized to have these massive caretaking parts that don't let them take care of themselves, which often leads, and Gabor and I both agree, often leads to physical symptoms. That's often what's behind physical symptoms, um, medical symptoms. And so those are manager parts. Again, what they have in common is they're trying to control everything, often they're trying to please everybody, and they are just trying to keep the exiles contained and, and not triggered. Certain parts you've called protectors, and I've heard you say in articles, in previous conversations, that often when couples fight, it's actually their protectors fighting each other. I wonder if we could sort of dive in here a little bit because I'm sure most people, if not everyone listening to the show, has been in that situation where someone close to them, let's say their partner, um, they, they've had a blazing row with. And I think this is a really quite empowering and quite comforting idea that it's actually not them rowing with each other it's actually their protectors so maybe talk about it in in the context of couples fighting yeah often when couples come into my office it's parts wars there's no self in sight you know this the c word self that i was talking about earlier and it's just these protective parts battling with each other and um, and when they, when these parts take over, I know, you know, I can, I can stay in self, uh, with most people in most contexts, except my wife and she, <laughs> like nobody has a way of, of triggering my protectors. And when that protective part of me takes over and we're in it, you know, she looks different. She looks far less attractive. I'm thinking all these negative things about her that I don't think about otherwise. And out of my mouth comes things that, you know, I don't really believe, but, you know, I, I believe, you know, a version of that in a, in a nasty voice. And both of us have gotten very good at when that starts to happen, calling a timeout and we would, we both go in, we separate and we do what we call, a U-turn in our focus. So instead of focusing on her and what's wrong with her, I focus inside and I notice the part who was doing the talking. I notice what it's protecting. And when it feels like I can be back in self in those C-word qualities, then I invite her to come back and I speak from self for those parts to her. <clears throat> like, when you said that thing, it triggered this really furious part of me. And I, I could feel it really going off on you. And I'm sorry I let it do that. And when I listened inside, it, you know, it was protecting this very, this very hurt part that, uh, that really didn't, you know, really took to heart what you were saying about me as a person that didn't feel good at all. And so I want to speak for that part too. And I, I wish you wouldn't say things like that because it really does go right to that heart. Yeah. But I am very sorry that I let that, that big protector take over. Thank you for sharing that example. I imagine that you, Dick, have got a pretty good level of self-awareness as to when it's your parts and your protectors starting to take over and speak, given the work that you do, given the, you know, the amount of time you've been helping people and through that, I'm sure helping yourself. That might be quite difficult for people initially, like in the actual emotion of a fight or conflict. It might be quite difficult to be able to even have that awareness to 
take a pause and say, hey, look, you know, we just need to sort of change perspective at the moment. Just I'll come back in five minutes or whatever. And, and I guess when I think of IFS and certainly my relationship with IFS, I feel that it does an incredible job first of all, of giving people awareness where previously there may not have been awareness, which I think is incredibly valuable, but it doesn't stop there. I think it takes the next step, which is, okay, now that I've got the awareness, let me go in and, I guess in my words, I would say, rewrite the story, change something. Whereas not all therapies, in my experience, do that. So let's go back to couples for a second. Um, Anyone who's hearing this who might be thinking, yeah, that happens with my husband or my wife or my partner. Um, is there anything practical they can think about doing in that moment? The moment when our protector takes over? Yeah. Um, get away from get away from your partner. Uh, <laughs> and you know, there there are still times where I I'm not aware and Gene will say, you know. You are you're in a protector. I say no, I'm not. Like, no, <laughs> <laughs> and still I'll listen to her and I'll separate and I'll find out. Oh, she's right. You know. Yeah. Uh, even though I don't want to admit it, um, but yeah, it's challenging. It takes a while before you you get the hang of it. And there is a very physical, like I could do an ox exercise with you or with your audience. Yeah, sure. Where you would really feel the physical difference between a protector and what I'm calling self. Let's do it. Yeah, I, I'd be up for that. Okay. All right. So think of somebody in your life that uh, triggers you. And uh, you don't have to disclose who it is, but you can if you want. Kind of consistently gets your goat. Okay, yeah. All right, and then put that person in a room by him or herself. And you're outside the room looking through a window at him or her or they. And the, the room is contained. Okay, yeah, I'm there, I'm looking. All right, and then while you're looking, have the person do or say the thing that gets to you. And just notice what happens in your body and your mind as that protector jumps in. I felt just a general sort of tightness and tightening up in my body and my mind, uh, a frustration. Um, yeah, those those are the things that I initially felt. Yeah, so so you're noticing your muscles, and you're frustrated in your mind. Yeah. Also, check and see how open your heart is now. I also felt my heart rate going up, actually, which I didn't uh -huh. say as soon as you said it before. I felt I could really feel my heart and it going up. So yeah. um, I would definitely say it does not feel open. Yeah. And what kind of urges or impulses are coming as you see the person doing this? You know, things like, oh, I wish they wouldn't. Um, why do they keep doing that over and over again? We've, 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 we've been here before. We've had that conversation. Why does it keep happening? Those are the things that are coming up for me. Yeah, good. And then keeping your eyes closed, but go ahead in this inner world and look at that person through the window and tell me what he or she or they look like now. Well, I mean, even just looking at them through the window, I felt my body lighter and relax. And I actually felt a smile come on. Okay. Um, and I just see them being just, you know, being themselves, like for who they are. Like I can actually just see that just 
they're very close to me. They've got all these lovely qualities. Uh, they're just getting on with their day. That's again, I I'm not sure I'm. <laughs> this is me and my my programming, but like I'm not sure I'm doing it right. Um, oh no but, no no, that's that's great. So what happened when I asked you to look at the person that evoked yourself and that protector relaxed somehow. And, and so just notice now what it feels like in your body and in your mind. Yeah, it feels completely different. I feel less tense. I feel heart rate slowed down. Actually, I even feel my, my tone of voice has changed somewhat. I feel... Totally changed, yeah. Has it? Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I want to smile and I do feel open hearted at the moment. Yeah. And you would relate from this place if the person was in the room, right? Was in your room now, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. But to continue just for a minute, go back to that protector who was so irritated. Okay. And fi find him again in your body. Yeah. And how do you feel toward him as you notice him there? So I, I, I'm aware, I can feel, um, when, when I go back to the process, I can feel a tightness in my upper right back. And how do I feel towards it? Yeah, how do you feel toward him or it? Well, I feel, I guess I feel a separation first, first, first of all, a separation in the sense that, oh, I can see that that is just a part that's kind uh -huh. of sitting there. It's right. not all of me. That's the that's first right. thing I can see. Um, I guess I want to say I feel <laughs> compassion towards it, but I don't in this moment. No, I don't no, think. No, no, just be totally honest. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. So what do you feel? Probably a frustration that it's there. Yeah, of course. Okay. But we are going to ask the one who's frustrated with the angry one if it would give us the space to help it and get to know it a little bit. And just see if the one who's so frustrated would be willing to open some space and separate a little bit. Yeah, it's willing to step away. Okay. And then focus on the irritated guy again and notice how you feel toward him now. Well, as the frustrated part uh, steps away, I actually just felt that area ease off. Uh -huh. Literally instantaneously. Right. And, you know, it still surprises me, when, when, you know, when that happens, but it, but it really just happened immediately. I just didn't feel that tightness as soon as it um, happily steps away. And perhaps, could that because I've done some of this work before? And so... But, no, a lot of times people could do it this readily, so... Okay, so it steps but, away. I feel lighter. And how do, you, how do you feel toward the original protector now? Yeah, I feel I feel okay towards it. I feel ah oh, okay, it was it was there. It was trying to do something. I I feel it it's in the word, right? But I I feel it was trying to protect me. And mm -hmm. I'm actually quite thankful. It's like okay, cool. You were you're trying to protect me, but you you don't need to, but mm -hmm. I see what you were trying to do. So yeah, Tell, say those words to him and just see how he reacts to getting that appreciation. Yeah, he, he feels, he feels good. Actually, he feels almost relieved that, oh, I had to, I've got to do that role, but you're saying I don't need to do that role. So yeah, I would say he feels relieved. That's great. Yeah. Ask him how old he thinks you are. Yeah. 
he thinks I mean you know sometimes I find you just have to trust here because sometimes I'm like well is it my mind imagining this or is this right, right. really happening but what I what I think what I feel he thinks I am is five years old right so let him know you're older than that and just see how he reacts to that information yeah um again i i i think it's relief that yeah yeah, yeah so let him know you can handle a lot more than you could when you were five and that he doesn't need to keep protecting you this way from people like the one in the room you can deal with these people yeah and see if he's starting to trust that more yeah i feel that that part is happy to to stand aside and that that word relief keeps coming up that good, good. hey yeah that's i don't need to it's quite a tiring role i don't need to do it anymore that's right and ask him if he really came to trust that what might he like to do inside of you instead of this uh being this irritated guy he could do anything he wanted I, I think he just wants to hang out and and uh -huh. and sort of <laughs> relax and relax and chill and sort of accompany me along my life and see what I'm doing. That's certainly that's what I'm feeling. So let him know that that's his new role if he wants it. Okay. Um, does this feel like enough? Because we could keep going, but. What do you think? Yeah, look, I mean, certainly for me, it feels enough. Um, I'm very happy to keep going. My, as I said at the start, I, I really want this to have value for people. I really want them to get a sense that actually it can be helpful in so many different uh, instances. So if you feel keeping going would be helpful, then yeah, let's do it. Okay, yeah, let's keep going. All right, so go back to him. And ask him if he protects another part of you that's vulnerable. And don't think of the answer, Rangan. Just wait and see what comes. Well, he's saying he's protecting the five-year-old me. Yeah and ask if he would give us permission to go to that five-year-old so we can heal him. Yeah, he says, yeah. And then just ask in general in there if there are any other parts of you that might be afraid for us to do that or to do it in this context of your podcast. So the part that's presenting itself at the moment is, will this be useful for anyone? Will anyone think this is helpful for me? Or will they think, you know, yeah. what are you doing? So that's, that's so, the so part that's coming up. Let's just see if he'll give us some space, even, uh, you know, I strongly suspect it'll be very helpful. But just ask him to trust you and me for a minute and to step back in there. Okay. Yeah, he stepped back. Any other fears about going to the five-year-old? No. I'm quite sort of looking forward to it, actually. Okay. Then go ahead and focus on him and find him in your body or around your body. Okay. Where do you find him? I mean, I think I find him around the stomach area. Okay. And as you notice him down there, how do you feel toward him? Yeah, like love. 
go ahead. And I feel so I'm breathing him... more deep as I focus on the stomach area. I feel instantaneously I'm just breathing more into it and I'm breathing more deeply and more slowly. Perfect. And let him know that you love him and just see how he reacts. Yeah, he's got a big smile on his face. Good. And how close would you say you are to him in there in terms of meters away? I say I'm about one and a half to two meters away from him. Okay, good. Yeah, so you're pretty close. So let's just ask what he wants you to know about himself. And don't think of the answer. Just wait and see what he says to you. What was that? Can you repeat the question? Well, yeah, just the open question of what does he want you to know about himself? He's saying um, he wants me to know that he wants to be loved. Uh huh. Okay. So let him know you get that. And maybe you can repeat to him that you love him. And see if that feels good or it's not enough or he wants somebody else. Just ask. No, he, he loves that, that I've told him I love him. Okay, good. Yeah. So he does seem to trust that. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, then ask what he wants you to know about what happened to him in the past. And again, don't think, just wait and see what comes. And you don't have to share it if you don't feel like it. Yeah, he's, um, he's told me something about, um, this this desire to be loved, this um, really that he wants to be unconditionally loved, yeah. No matter what he does, is what he really wants. And so he what he didn't feel that is that what he's saying? Yeah, he's telling me that he feels he has to um, do certain things uh -huh. in order to feel that love. Yeah, and what's that like for him to have to do that? It doesn't like it. It feels like it's tiring. It's always an effort. He's, yeah, he, he, he doesn't like it. And what does it make him feel about himself? It makes him feel that... Um, Yeah, he feels he's got to do things to get that love. So he feels that he's got to change parts of who he is and how he does right. things uh -huh. to, to get that love. Yeah, so he feels that parts of him aren't acceptable by themselves. Yeah. Okay. And how are you feeling toward him as you're getting this? I mean... Me, yeah, I, I feel um, nothing but just ways of compassion for him. I just want to cuddle up this five-year-old. <laughs> so, I want to cuddle up me as a five-year-old. Right, right. So go ahead and do that. And also let him know that you're getting how, how hard that was for him. That, that we're all getting that. Sounds really hard. And see how he reacts to being understood. Yeah, he's got, got a smile on his face because yeah. he knows that I'm there to be there for him and support him. And I think, 
he kind of really likes it that I'm there. Okay. And you can be there with him, but let's let's go into the time that he's stuck in the past and be there with him too. Such that you don't see yourself with him, you're just there. You see him and his surroundings. Just like you and I are talking, you don't see yourself with me, you're just talking to me. So I want you to do the same with him. Just be there in the way he needed somebody in the past where he's stuck. And just tell me when you're back there with him. Yeah, I'm back there with him. And how are you being with him? I'm uh, I'm trying to have fun with him. Uh, uh -huh. I've got smiles on my face. Uh -huh. uh, I want to, I'm trying to show him that he is loved and that he doesn't need to change who he is. So I'm, yeah, I'm trying to just radiate uh, warmth and uh, and love towards him. Perfect. And he seems to be uh, trusting that. Yeah, he's um, he's just giggling now and uh, laughing and like mm -hmm. I can see him beckoning me over to sort of play with him. Good. And then ask him if there's anything he wants you to do for him back there before we take him to a good place. Is there anybody he wants you to say something to or deal with for him? Uh, yeah, he does. He wants okay, me so to um, have a chat to, you know, other people there who he feels don't understand. Yeah. So go ahead and do that for him as much as he needs you to. And he can watch how you deal with them. He's seen me have a conversation, explain um, uh -huh. how he's feeling. Uh -huh. And, you know, he's, he can see that I'm explaining it very non confrontationally, very kindly, just trying to uh -huh. share a different perspective. And he's kind of nodding at me. He, if he, he likes the fact that I'm, I'm doing this for him. Yeah, I was just going to ask how he's he's liking watching you do this for him. Sounds like he is liking it. Yeah. Okay. Then ask if now he's ready to leave that time and place and come either to the present with you or to a fantasy place of his choice. Yeah, he'd like to go to just go and do something fun together in a different place. Okay. So go ahead and set that up. Yeah, so I'm taking him to uh, the woods near his house where he likes to play. Great. And um, yeah, we've gone there on our, on our, on our bikes. Good. And So tell him you're going to be taking care of him now this way. And given that, ask if he's ready now to unload the feelings and beliefs he got back there. Yeah, he's ready. And ask where he carries all that in his body or on his body. Um, I'm not getting an answer. I, I don't think he okay. knows. Just ask him to just check, scan his body and see if there's something that doesn't belong to him in it or on it. And if he can't find it, that's fine. It's not a problem. 
but just have them check. Yeah, he says it's in his stomach. Okay. And what would he like to give it up to? Light, water, fire, wind, earth, or anything else? He'd like to put it into a fire. So maybe set up a fire for him and tell him to take all that out of his stomach and let the fire take care of it. And just do that until it's all gone. Yeah, he's put it all in the fire. How does he feel without it? Yeah, he likes it. It feels good. He's, he says he feels sort of lighter and freer. Uh -huh. And tell him now, if he'd like to, he can invite qualities into his body. And you can just see what comes into him, what he, whatever he'd like to have. Yeah, he said he would like that. So tell him to go ahead, whatever he'd like to have, just tell him to invite it in. Yeah, he's invited it in. How's he seem now? Yeah, he feels, he, he seems good. He's um, smiling. He's, um, yeah, he's sort of kind of, moving around, sort of playing around, um, yeah. looking around in the woods. Yeah. Okay, good. And let's invite the guy who was protecting him to come and see him now and just see how that part reacts. Yeah, the, 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 the part that was protecting him feels, um, feels pretty good and feels, feels satisfied that he doesn't, the, the, the five-year-old doesn't need protecting anymore. That's great. Yeah, that's terrific. So does that feel complete for now? Yeah. Feels pretty good. So thank your parts for letting us do this much. And when it feels right, you can just start to shift your focus back outside. Yeah. And how do you feel now? Um, I feel good, actually. Um, I feel free in my body. I, yeah, that, that, that felt, um, that, that felt pretty significant actually. Did to me as well. Um, I don't know how long that took, but it wasn't very long. And the reason is because you bring so much self right away to the process and I don't know if that's because you've been working at it in, with IFS for a while or you did right away, but it's a, a thing of beauty to watch. I, I feel sorry to interrupt. If you are enjoying this content, there's loads more just like it on my channel. So please do take a moment to press subscribe, hit the notification bell, and now back to the conversation. A bit emotional, a bit uh, teary and aware that several hundred thousand people are gonna uh, <laughs> uh, listen to this. But yeah, it felt pretty significant actually. And um, I feel very light in my body. And speaking to what you just said, um, Dick, I don't think in my first few sessions, it was that quick for me to, um, you know, I, I don't think when I asked the parts to step aside, I don't think they easily did. And I, I, I think you're probably right that the fact that I've done this on many occasions means that I can go in. Um, 
And maybe this conversation has come at the right time because I was thinking today, should I do a session to, to, to you know, do something with Dick? And I thought, nah, you know what? There's plenty to talk about. Um, you know, I can't really think of what I would bring up anyway. Although I will say in the last 24 hours, a couple of little bits of friction have actually occurred in my personal life um, in, in a way that they haven't for, for quite a while, which I guess is always... I, I see IFS as a way of me being a compassionate detective in, in, inside, in my inner world. That's so right. I, can, I can sort of you know, walk around in my inner world and, you know, just inquire as to what's going on and, but, but not, not trying to, um, be annoyed at any parts, right. but that's actually right. to, to understand why are they there? That, that's, that's, right. that's, that's what it's felt like to me. Yeah. And, and that, it does become a kind of life practice where you go through your day and certainly if you ever get triggered, you're going to get curious and find what we call the trailhead to that trigger, that the thought or the emotion is the trailhead. And if you stay with it, you'll find the part that's coming from. And you do it, like you said, from curiosity and then compassion when you learn about why the part's doing it. And, uh, and what happens is you do that, which is clearly what's happening to you is your parts come to trust you as a leader. Uh, and that's why they could separate so quickly. That's, there are four goals of IFS. The first one is the liberation of these parts from the roles they've been stuck in so they can be who they're designed to be, which we did do with that irritated guy and uh, also with the boy. <clears throat> and then the second goal is restoring their trust in you as a leader in, in what I call the self with a capital S, which because you could show that boy, you could protect him and speak for him. And you were so respectful and compassionate with the angry guy. They just start to trust that there is this. And, and when you told that angry guy, you weren't five years old anymore. That helps for him to, so, oh, there is some kind of grown up in there that can handle things. I don't have to do it because many of these protectors are what in family therapy we call parentified children, parentified inner children. They were forced to take on roles that they weren't equipped for, like a, a child in a family that has to be the parent. Mm. So they're relieved, like, he's, like that guy kept saying, he's so relieved to know he doesn't have to do it all the time. Yeah, and, and so, go ahead. I, I was going to say that in terms of inner worlds reflecting outer worlds. I mean, certainly, there's no question within my 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 external family with you know the family with which I grew up. I've had to take on a role of a parent. I would say very early on. Yeah, that was um, that was a big part of my role uh, yeah. with my family, and so it's it's very interesting to hear you sort of reflect that as to what happens in our inner world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so some of these protectors became in both internal parental children, parentified children, and external parentified children in your family's context, and. And partly as a result, that boy never felt uh, unconditional love. I don't know never, but he didn't feel a lot of unconditional love um, because he had to play this role all the time. And I was going to go through the other two goals. Oh, One is, yeah. The, the third is uh, we didn't do a lot of it, but bringing these parts together like we did at the end and seeing now they have, they can form new relationships that are much more harmonious and uh, work together in different ways. And then the last goal is to, to for you to be more 
self-led in the outside world and both in relationships with your family but also you know as you get to know self more and more uh, self has a kind of vision for your life and uh so sees clearly that's one of those c words and it can see injustice and so you're motivated to do something about injustice and imbalance in the world and and so some of what uh, I try to do is help people access more self, and then they become more and more activists. And I, I am working with uh, some of the top activists in the world to help them do their activism from a more self-led place. Yeah. As you talk about those goals, uh, you know, I, I, I'm I'm led to this thinking about IFS that I passionately believe it's for everyone, like every single person. I cannot imagine there's someone out there who would not benefit um, from IFS or a form of it in their lives. And I think, you know, sometimes I feel, I don't know if you ever feel this, Dick, that is it seen as a form of psychotherapy? And if it is seen as a form of psychotherapy, is that in some ways problematic in terms of expanding its reach? Because what I feel it's something that sits, that you can use alongside other practices, you can use whatever religion you are, whatever your spiritual belief system is, you can still use this as a technique and as a framework for, you know, detecting what's going on in your inner world and changing it. But I think some people think therapy Oh, that, that's for sick people. Like, that's for people who've got depression or, you know, that they're really struggling. They need therapy. What, what on earth do I need therapy for? Right. You're right. It is, that is a problem as we try to expand our reach with it. Uh, and we're playing with different ways to, to frame it. Uh, because now we are working with non-therapists and we are also trying to non-therapists like uh, coaches, executive coaches and and uh, other kinds of professions, teachers and uh, but also we're we're trying to to how can we bring this to the public in a safe way? because it it is, as you saw, it can take you to delicate places quickly. and everybody's got a kind of delicate, inner ecology that if you make a couple wrong moves could blow up. So that's the challenge now. And uh, I'm, I'm convinced that there's a version of it that we can bring to the public in a safe way. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's exciting for me to hear you catch the larger vision of it because I've ha held that vision for many, many years, <laughs> basically by myself. And now a number of people are starting to carry it with me. Yeah, no, it's it's so clear to me that it actually has universal application. You know, I I as I said, I I went into it. I didn't have a diagnosed, you know, and I'm saying this with inverse commas problem or a an official diagnosis. No, I had a I had a I had a body complaint, and uh, the person I was seeing thought that this would be a good thing to explore. But I could feel the difference. I could feel the power of it. And the drive for me, a lot of it was after my dad died. You know, I really wanted to understand myself better, understand my programming. Why did I think certain ways? Why did I make certain decisions in certain ways? Why did some people trigger me in certain ways and not others? And also becoming a parent, that was huge. Yeah. Because, you know, you transform yourself, you, you naturally automatically transform the way that you parent because otherwise right. you're just imprinting your kids with the same kind of adaptations that i developed that i'm trying to get rid of or, or trying to reframe let's put it in my 30s and 40s yeah. it's like well there's an opportunity here to not put that onto my kids um yeah i mean to the point where i sometimes think well, I bet you kids could intuitively get some of these concepts. Oh, that's not me. That's a part of me that just got angry. Have you got any experience of doing this with kids? 
Oh yeah, yeah. There's a lot of IFS therapists that are are child therapists, and they kids get it right away. They haven't been socialized away from the phenomena. So when you ask about one part, they'll tell you about three others. And with them, we use a lot of play therapy technique, younger kids. So draw your parts or puppets or the kids love it actually. So it's, that's all very, very fun. And, and they have self, they, they have the ability, you know, they can't drive a car, but they have the ability to heal themselves that way and, and be good inner parents to their exiles. So it's, it's uh, very joyful to work with kids. One of the other benefits I I just like to share with people to to really again keep sort of highlighting how powerful I think it is is that I, I've been thinking a lot, um, Dick, about this concept of personality over the last few months, and you know, for most of my life, my friends and my family would tell me I have an addictive personality. And there were various ways in which I would um, demonstrate that addiction. If I get into something, I'm all in. Um, and, you know, probably when I was at university in Edinburgh, you know, I used to like going to the casino or uh, gambling on a game of pool or frankly gambling on anything just for a bit of a bit of a buzz. Um, mm -hmm. And I would do it quite a lot, but never to the point where you think this is a problem, let's say. But what's really, really interesting is as I've gone on this self-healing journey, I've not tried to stop gambling or I've not tried to stop any of those other things. They've just naturally fallen by the wayside as if they, they no longer need to be there to do what they previously did. Yeah, that's what we find over and over. So, you know, we have um, groups of IFS therapists working mainly with addicts of various kinds. And rather than going to the, the part that does the addiction activity and trying to get it to stop, we go to it sort of in the way we did with your protector. And we learn about what it's trying to do, how, what it's trying to protect. We get permission to go to that, just like we did with your five-year-old. And we heal that younger part that it's protecting. And then you're right, the addict part says, oh, I don't need to do this, I'll do what I would rather do. And people sort of naturally stop doing it. Whereas if you came to that addict part and said, I want you to cut this out, that part's gonna say, you don't know what'll happen if I stop doing this. All these feelings are gonna come flooding or I'll get suicidal if I don't have the, the distraction of the addiction or, so, uh, yeah, so it's just a very different approach to both understanding things like addiction and having helping people relate to themselves around it. That again, I just want to say how thrilling it was to, to meet with Gabor because we just yeah. think about it basically the same way. Yeah, I remember my first meeting with Gabor in London a few years ago and we just struck up such a wonderful connection. Um, there's a, you know, I'm a different generation to Gabor, but there was certainly a similarity in terms of we were seeing things, certain things within our profession didn't make sense. We were seeing things a slightly different way. And there was a real kind of, there was a real resonance between us. It was really, it was a, it was a really lovely conversation. And, you know, I'm delighted that I've got to know him well over the last few years. Um, but, but that, that idea about personality, I think, I think take what, what I think is incredible about this idea that there's multiple minds within us, these different parts. And if you've lived your whole life, let's say you're a 40 year old adult, and a lot of these protectors and these exiles got into place when you were five, six, seven, eight, then you might be thinking that you are a certain type of person. Like you think this is my personality, but what, right. what I've discovered is that when you make friends with these parts, make peace with them, and you know, go through the process of realizing that there's no bad parts, they're all there, they're all trying to protect you, I kind of feel that elements of your personality 
change that. I'm not sure anymore if I do have an addictive personality because I don't, you know, it, I, I don't think I do. Like I think I did and it played a role in my life. Right. Does that make sense to you? And is this something you've totally. seen with other people? Yeah, we see it over and over, you know, calling, saying that you have an addictive personality is saying you have this one mind, like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And it has this inclination and you're kind of stuck, you're stuck with that. You know, that's who you are. Instead saying, yeah, I've got this part who's trying to protect me by distracting or, or getting the rush that you mentioned, the buzz, and it's trying to keep me away from these others. And it's a totally different understanding of yourself. And you start to relate inside with a lot more, uh, a lot less shame and a lot more compassion. You know, I could take the, what's called the, the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, and there are all these categories of diagnoses, and I could give you a parts-based uh, description of each of those. It's, each of them is pretty accurate in terms of the way this person presents, but it's really just a description of the cluster of protectors that are dominating that person's life. And as the person heals, then those parts relax and they're no longer fit that diagnosis. We just published uh, a paper in a peer reviewed journal where we had uh, 13 people with moderate to severe PTSD get 16 sessions of IFS. And at the end of those 16 sessions, only one still qualified for the diagnosis because all these parts had just shifted into their naturally valuable states. Yeah, it's so powerful. And, you know, the way we like to label, you know, patients in my instance, clients in your instance, I, I think is, is, is potentially very problematic. On one hand, it's helpful because it's showing people, oh, there's, it's, you know, a lot of people feel that the medical profession think that something's in their heads. And so, you know, people like the validation. No, no, this is not in my head. This is actually something. That's right. That's and, right. and I totally get that. But I do think also by putting these labels and, you know, badges on people, I think it can really become problematic. Some people then become, they really identify with that. That is who they are. I, you know, I have depression. That's why I feel like this. And maybe it's just subtly shifting the language, like in, I guess, an IFS language, you know, a part of me feels depressed at the moment. Would, that, right. would that be accurate? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I, I don't use that language yet, although I probably will soon. <laughs> but I would, I would say to a patient, look, you know, at the moment, you have got a few symptoms that are consistent with a diagnosis of depression, but that's just at the moment, right? Let's figure out what's causing that. Um, so I'm always trying to create a bit of distance uh, with my patients from the diagnosis, just so they know removing that diagnosis may be possible in the near future. That's right. And, and uh, when you get that diagnosis, and, and it includes medical diagnoses, then you are trying to you know, I, I reviewed a paper, uh, a book recently, uh, and I wish I could pull up the author's name, but I liked the metaphor she used. It's like you're driving in your car and the red light comes on on the dashboard. And so you, you pull over and you try to tear out the red light and get rid of it or uh, take it to a mechanic and replace the red light rather than lifting the hood and seeing what's going on in there. And that's a lot of what uh, I think both medicine and psychiatry try to do. And a lot of those attempts to get rid of the symptom can make them worse or people take horrible amounts of medication that affect their bodies when all they needed to do was just focus on the symptom itself, get curious about it. We published a study some years ago in, uh, in the Journal of Rheumatology, actually, where we had 30 uh, severe, moderate to severe RA patients, rheumatoid arthritis patients, 
And then we had, it was a random, it was a nice RCT. We had a, a 30 who got an educational control and the, the uh, treatment group got a course of IFS. And at the end of it, uh, many people uh, were much better and some went into complete remission simply by focusing on, and this was in Boston here at, at Boston Women's Hospital. So they were mainly uh, Irish Catholic mothers who'd never been in therapy. And we simply had them focus on the pain and get curious about it. And they began hearing from the parts that were using the pain to try and get a message through that stop taking care of everybody else and take care of yourself instead. Which again, is just like Gabor's work. When yeah. the body says no, it's the body's gonna have to say no, it's gonna cripple you so you can't take care of everybody if you don't stand up for yourself. Yeah. We'll get the links to some of these papers and put them in the show notes for people who right. want to study more and actually read those articles. Dick, for people who, well, I guess for myself as well, I, I definitely feel that what we went through was was pretty significant. I did feel a bit maybe shaky afterwards. And I'm not sure how much of that is. There is a part of me that is aware that this is a public forum as well. It's not yeah. just me doing this privately with just one-on-one -on -one with a therapist so yeah. you know i'd be lying if i said that there wasn't a part of me that is very very aware of that and wondering sure. is this a good idea should i share it should i not share it <laughs> should i talk to my wife and discuss is this a good thing um but for me in terms of post care after something like that so i i pretty sure I know what to do anyway. But I also wonder if some people will rewind and go through that uh, process themselves in their own life. I think that could be really valuable for them. Any sort of words of advice, practical tips that people should be aware of so that if they do that, they know how to kind of look after themselves afterwards? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, so there are two things. One is uh, IFS isn't just the session we just did. For that to stick, the work you just did, you need to follow up. So there's a kind of homework pause practice where every day for a month or so, you go to that five-year-old, you make sure he's still in the woods or wherever you took him, uh, that, he, that he feels that you still remember him, you're not gonna let him abandon him. You remind the former protector that he can just relax and trust you. So there's an ongoing, almost like a meditation every day, a kind of working with these parts to maintain the gains. And then there are some people who can just take it and run with it and do a huge amount on their own. Yeah, I don't happen to be one of those, but if people do try a version of this, again, sometimes you can go very deep, very fast and then you are uh, potentially subject to what we call backlash, which is some of what you're feeling now about what the hell did I just do? That, that parts um, who didn't want you to go to that boy will get really upset with you and, and uh, you know, make sure you never do it again and that kind of thing. So. So that's some of what we're trying to tease out as we try to bring this to the public in a safe way. Yeah. But just to, uh, if that if that were to happen to someone in your audience, just so they would know it for what it is, it's just a part that got scared to allow you to go to these vulnerable places and needs more of your attention before you do it again. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, another, well, there's there's many, of course, but what resources would you like to direct people to? Um, hopefully people have, have never heard of IFS will now be aware and think, wow, you know, I'm pretty keen to explore. Um, I hope some people will listen and go, you know, I'd be quite keen to train uh, as a therapist. I've got to say, Dick, sometimes I think about that. I genuinely think, I think I'd quite like to learn uh, 
you know, technically professionally, you know, we, we've not got into this in the conversation today, I was hoping to, but maybe if we, we do a part two at some point, we can talk about the, this whole idea that I have that IFS could be so useful for almost all of my patients, because I've said before that, you know, 80 to 90% of what we see as medical doctors is in some way related to our collective modern lifestyles. That's not putting blame on people. I'm just saying the way society is set up with huge amounts of stress, kind of this, this problematic definition of success, I think, this culture of working more, doing more than your body can literally bear. I think ultimately this results in symptoms. And a lot of the time, even those of us who are inclined to think about lifestyle as a form of medicine, mm -hmm. even then we overly rely on things like willpower for people to make yeah. these choices. And it can be very problematic and very short lived. So I, I really feel maybe we'll save this for part two, because I think right. um, if you're up for it at some point, I think there's a really interesting discussion there about beyond like your internal, of course, it's your internal world, but it also impacts your behaviors, your willingness to exercise, your willingness to eat well. Like I, I don't find those things an effort anymore in a way that I might've done in the past because, mm -hmm. you know, I feel I've got a, such a high degree of compassion for myself now in a way that I didn't in the past. Yeah. Like I want to look after myself, you know, yeah. I, I want to do stuff that, that makes me, that nourishes me. So I, I've gone off on two separate things here. I was trying to say, <laughs> What resources, um, well, feel free to comment on any of that, but also where can I point people to? Sure. So I'll start with the willpower issue because that is the way we're socialized to deal with ourselves. And if you don't want to exercise because you don't have willpower. And so that builds up this sort of inner drill instructor who screams at you to do it or, or overrides all the parts of you who don't want to and creates these inner polarizations that get bigger and bigger over time. And so again, as you heal, that that drill instructor realizes he doesn't have to do that anymore and you, you tell him that. Uh, and, and then he relaxes like your protector did. And then you can exercise for the joy of it and you don't necessarily, uh, maybe work out as hard as you did before, but that's okay because you don't have to kick your ass to do it. And you listen to other parts who don't like that and uh, other parts who don't need you to be muscled and, and uh, very thin. And it becomes a kind of a negotiation among all of your different parts and what they want with you as the the chairman of the board or with you sitting at the kitchen table with the big discussion going on as the head of the family. Uh, so, and then resources, our website is ifs-institute.com and on it, you'll find a lot of books and uh, videos and things like that. And we also have a, a training called the online circle, uh, mainly for people. We have a huge waiting list for our trainings now, which I feel constantly bad about, but it's a nice problem to have. So many people can't get in. So we have a online program for them to at least get the basics. And that's available to most anybody. And then in terms of books, uh, which aren't necessarily on the website. Uh, the book you mentioned, No Bad Parts. Um, there it is. As you, as you said, it's a pretty easy read and uh, uh, they can, people can get that on Amazon. And, um, and also there's an intro to IFS that uh, we currently sell on our website, but we've just licensed to Sounds True to, to market, to sell. And then there's a book on couples called You're the One You've Been Waiting For that people seem to like a lot. It's for the public too. So those are the books I would point people to. And, you know, there are a lot of video lectures on YouTube and, and uh, examples of me working with people too. Yeah. 
There's also an IFS UK group that's very, very active. I think that's their website is IFS UK. Uh, and so there are, they run a lot of trainings too. Yeah. We're going to pick up all these links. Uh, I'll also drop them in the show notes section so that people who, you know, want to find out more either as a, you know, recipient of the therapy um, or as a practitioner, um, you know, I really want them to have places where they can go. And I, I, as I say that, Dick, as a recipient of the therapy, I, I immediately want to correct that because you're not really a recipient, are you? You're an active participant. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. When clients finish with me, they generally say some version of, you're a pretty good therapist, but I healed myself. <laughs> and that's true. This is what's called attachment theory taken inside. Attachment theory is very influential and, and most much of it very accurate uh, about how kids do or don't attach to their caregivers. This is saying, let's get these, these kid parts to attach to you yourself uh, and start to trust you as a caretaker. And that really frees people up because so many relationship problems are caused because my exiles want to be taken care of by my wife. They don't, they don't know they can get anything from me. And so they latch, I'm not saying this is true now because I've worked with my exiles and they trust me, but for many people, your exiles want uh, to be taken care of in the way they weren't by your parents, by your partner. And that's an impossible task. And so your partner winds up hurting you in the same way. And then all your protectors go crazy. But if your exiles feel taken care of by you, that frees your partner up. They, your partner can be the secondary caretaker, not the primary. So one more thing before we stop, I wanna mention, and that is that in addition to the resources we mentioned, there's a foundation called the Foundation for Self-Leadership it's not profit and, and sponsors research and uh, kind of educational programs and um, and is uh, you know just really wonderful organization, not connected to me, but it, it, the, the studies that I mentioned they funded and so uh, they're very interested in donations. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Again, we'll put all these links in uh, for people. I just want to say, uh, Dick, at the end of our conversation, um, that I, I think what you've given to the world is it's just incredible. And the ripple effects, I feel that this way of looking at our inner worlds, I think will be seen and felt for years as the world becomes seemingly more and more divided, certainly when you go online, yet when you actually really interact in person with real people in real life, I actually find that people are loving, compassionate, caring. They they want to do the right thing for other people. And I really feel IFS is, is helping people be compassionate to all parts of themselves. And naturally, they're going to be more compassionate to people around them. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see people in leadership roles, you know, politicians, uh, presidents. I'd love to see them understand this because, man, do we need it at the moment? Um, so I'll, please. I was just going to say, I said this earlier, but I don't run into many people who get the vi the big vision of it uh, and can articulate it in the way you just did. It's really, really thrilling for me to to hear you and to feel our connection now. Oh, no, I appreciate that. And, and I think that there's many books out there. I, I've only been reading this one for the last couple of days, you know, the new one, No Bad Parts. I, I can't think of a better primer for people because it's you know, some books can be really heavy and deep and people have to be really, really invested into really understanding every aspect of a particular modality. But I think this one 
it's just so beautifully written. I think the layman can pick it up and really get a very good understanding very quickly of what it is and how it might be applicable to them. So thank you for writing such a wonderful book. Um, the, the podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our lives. And I think once we start exploring our inner worlds more with a compassionate undertone, I think people are going to get a whole lot more out of their lives. So I wonder, there's a you know, as final words from you, Dick, at all for people who who are listening, who maybe feel a bit stuck, who maybe feel frustrated with the state of the world and, you know, their own lives. I wonder, have you got any sort of final words for people to give them a bit of hope? I guess what I'd say is um, this self with a capital S that I've, I've been talking about, we've been talking about the last two hours, is in there, even if you never feel many of those C-word qualities. It is in there, and it's just beneath the surface of these parts that feel so discouraged and hopeless and have you stuck. And it is possible, simply by convincing them to open a little space in there, to access more of that and to bring more of that to your life, both your inner life and your outer life. And uh, some people can do it on their own or from reading the book. Some people need a therapist to help them. But uh, I guarantee it's in there. And I also guarantee that when you stop fighting with these protectors and you start going to the exiles, everything starts to transform in the way that you so uh, beautifully described today. Beautiful, empowering message to leave people with. Dick Schwartz, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your incredible work. And uh, I really look forward to the next time we get to have a conversation. Thank you for inviting me. If that conversation helped you with your own negative self-talk, I think you are really going to enjoy this one about the main reasons that we feel lost in life and what we can do about it. Societies are less and less natural to the makeup of human beings from the evolutionary perspective, which means that children are being brought up under increasingly artificial and disconnected circumstances.